Hello, welcome again. Today I'm here to briefly discuss the concept colonial discourse, which is invoked in so many of post-colonial writings. And also it comes up in uh, dissertation topics as colonial discourse analysis, both in linguistics as well as in literary studies. So before I go on to discuss colonial discourse, I think it's important for us to understand how Foucault discusses discourse or tries to define it because that's from where the post-colonial authors derive the original concept. And there are different places in his work that Foucault defines discourse, but I think the most uh, clearly explained version of discourse from Foucault is in his book, Archaeology of Knowledge, where he starts by doing some negative work by suggesting that the discourse is not a statement, it's not a proposition. But for a discourse to emerge and stabilize itself, certain aspects, certain things must come together. First of all, it's a question of power and knowledge. Right, So a body of knowledge must emerge within a given field, scientific, social, which is produced by the specialists, right? These specialists then must also have positions within the society of prestige, right? So that they have the prestige of an institution behind them and then must have a certain specific expertise to make statements about a certain subject, produce works about a certain subject. So a body of knowledge produced by experts, experts who have the prestige of the institutions behind them or the state behind them all come together to create a scientific discourse. And after that scientific discourse has been established within that discourse, the experts are the enunciating subjects. They are the ones who can make statements that would be taken as truth. And the reason they can do that is because they have the institutional prestige, they have a degree, they have done research, they know the vocabularies of that field, and they are aligned with you know, an institution, a university, a government body, or certified by something. So let's say from the real life, I always use this example about discourse and how things mean within a discourse. Let's say you're walking with your little kid, three-year-old in a park and the little boy is being overactive and someone walks up to you and says, I think your child has ADD, attention deficit disorder. And you look at that person and say, who the hell gave you the right to say that about my child? But let us say that you got a note from your child's teacher suggesting that we think you need to take your child to a psychiatrist so that they can evaluate him if he has any problems. You make an appointment with a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist does his or her tests and declares that your child has mild ADD. Now you will, chances are you will believe in that diagnosis. And at the most, maybe you'll seek a second opinion. But the reason you believe in that diagnosis is because the doctor, the psychologist, or the psychiatrist is making that statement within the given discourse in which he's an expert, he has a bold certificate, he has a degree, you are in his or her office, which gives him or her the power to designate people, to label them, to give them, you know, and to give an opinion about them. And that you accept it because you are in this discourse of psychology or psychiatry where your role is to accept that. And the reason you do that is because you are within that discursive milieu. Right? Another thing that Foucault suggests in his explanation of discourse is what he says is that discourse is material. A lot of people have a under, uh, problem understanding that. Actually, in my opinion, Foucault is deriving that from Althusser's suggestion that ideology is material and how. 
what Foucault means by discourse being material is because it needs an apparatus to work through, right? It needs enunciating subjects, it needs a body of work, it needs institutional prestige, places, hospitals, colleges, universities. So that's the material aspect of it. But in the process of designating and labeling people, a discourse also creates objects which it must study or give an opinion on. And hence, a discourse then literally impacts people's lives, people's bodies, how they see themselves, how others see themselves. So hence, that is what makes a discourse material. So to conclude briefly, I mean, this is a very reductive discussion of Foucault's uh, concept of discourse. A discourse is a body of knowledge that comes together through the research of experts who have the institutional prestige, who have power to gather that knowledge, to produce it. And then with that knowledge, label certain groups and people a certain way. And we all exist in that discourse because we believe it, right? And we believe it because the statements are being made within a larger scientific discourse or social discourse. For post-colonial studies, the first person in my view to ever use Foucault's theorization of discourse extensively in a major work was Edward Said in his work, Orientalism. And he mentions that in the preface to the book, he actually cites two of Foucault's early works there. And think of what he's trying to do in Orientalism. What he's trying to explain in his own words, which I'm paraphrasing in Orientalism is, is that when he was reading about the Middle East, which, was, which is called the Orient in his book, he found out that there were certain tropes that kept emerging. It does, didn't matter whether it was a historical work or a fictional work, that there was a certain way in which the Orient was received in Europe and represented. And that view of the Orient according to Said, was discursively produced. There was a discourse that produced that view of the Orient. And that's the discourse that he calls Orientalism. And how was it produced? There was immense research on the Middle East, on the Orient, by scholars, by historians, by geographers, cartographers. A lot of people traveled to Egypt and other places and recorded it and wrote about it. There was romantic novels about it, right? Letters about it. So all of that fits into this larger discourse about the Orient itself, which Said calls Orientalism. And his argument in Orientalism is that for Europeans, it becomes impossible to see Egypt or any other part of the Orient as it is, because they are always mediating it through that discourse. Their idea of the Orient is thus discursively produced as this magical place, this wild place, this place which is out of history, where time doesn't change, which cannot be modern. All these tropes are produced through that body of knowledge, through research, romantic writing, fictional writing, and that is what he calls discourse. And that is what eventually comes to be colonial discourse. And analysis of it becomes the colonial discourse analysis. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that in Orientalism, Said picks up the Napoleonic invasion of Egypt as an example, right, as the beginning point. And the reason he does that is, and he mentions it in one of his video interviews, because what he's saying is that here is how it happens. In order to record a culture, you need to have power, right, to be there. You need to have the power to record it with your own perceptions, with your own view of looking at it. And then you need to have the power and resources to publish your research and disseminate it. And he gives you an exa the example that when Napoleon lands there, he's not just there with his army, he brings an army of geographers, sociologists, writers, and they produce their report on Egypt, which Said says is huge volumes, right? And it's the power to do so 
on Egypt to, to use Egypt as an object of research that is part of the imperial and colonial project. And what comes out of that produces then by and large the discursive framework within which the Orient is seen, experienced even, talked about, written about. So coming from Foucault to Said, then colonial discourse then is the discourse produced with power, knowledge, right? Institutions, research, writing, travel writing, literature that creates a certain view of native cultures, native people, mostly as either magical, violent, people who live outside the march of history, whose cultures are ossified, patriarchal, right, um, sensual. All of this is part of that colonial discourse because the object of study of that discourse is the native culture and native places. The purpose is to create a body of knowledge that tries to explain that culture but renders it in a way that the Europeans see themselves as superior in that discourse and see the natives of the colonized places as inferior, as out of time, out of sync with time, as prehistoric. And that, generally speaking, is the colonial discourse, production of native subjectivities to be offered to the Europeans to see the Orient, to see the colonies a certain way, mostly negative. And colonial discourse analysis then aims to unravel that discursive production of the natives and their cultures to pose challenges to it, right? One thing that we cannot do in doing colonial discourse analysis is to do just a hierarchical analysis. One thing we cannot do in a discursive situation is to attribute everything to a center or one person or one force, like unlike the Arcula, the uh, model in Marxism where there is a top and a bottom. In a discourse, the discourse, as Foucault suggests, is more diffuse and there is no one locus, one head. And we need to keep that in mind. So if you're doing colonial discourse analysis, it would be better to look at the wider web of discourse and not just attribute it to one source or one individual or one group or one political party. And secondly, Said got um, a lot of criticism for Orientalism because his project there was to explain the discourse and not explain the native acts of agency. So the early criticisms were, well, the natives have no voice here, even though in his later works he does that. So keep that in mind when you're doing colonial discourse analysis. Uh, also bear in mind that you can't just represent the natives as these passive recipients of the discursive power of the colonizers. Must Somewhere in your research, there must be an accounting of how did they resist Episteme uh, you know, in epistemological terms, in knowledge production, but also in literal uprisings and challenges to the colonialists. And that would be a more balanced critique of colonial discourse. And that would be a good colonial discourse analysis. So that's all from me now. Um, I hope this is useful to you. And uh, and if you have any questions, please post them in the comments and please do subscribe to this channel if you like and if you would like to be notified of any new uh, videos that I record on these subjects. And as always, thank you so much and I'll see you next time.